mentorship and financial resources to be able, um, whatever, to be able to accomplish whatever you believe a vision God has given you for your church, for your ministry. You've got to have some resources to get that done. And so I'll talk about that uh, a little bit. Um, you can't hear me? Yeah. Um, I've been told that I'm going to talk a little loud. I'm normally very loud. Uh, I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes. And then we're going to have dialogue for the last 30 minutes. So let me, I'm, not, I'm not good at taking questions and then trying to remember where I was. I'm not good at that at all. So let me, I'm going to rush through the PowerPoint. And then you can ask me whatever you want to ask me about ministry. About, I've been pastoring a long time. I pastored in Terre Haute, Indiana, at the St. Paul Church for three years. I started pastoring when I was 22 years old. So I've been going at it for quite some time. And I see I've been around the world. I've been around the country. And uh, so you can ask me whatever you want to ask me and, or make whatever comments that you want to make that you think would be helpful to each of us. And uh, hopefully we'll all get blessed out of this and we'll be out of here encouraged, inspired, and hopefully we get our church to go to a whole other level. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of coming together with brothers and sisters in the faith. Thank you for allowing us to be your children and to be a part of the church. Thank you for the spiritual gifts that you've given to each of us and the those that we serve with and those that we serve. And now, Lord, we pray that you will empower us. We pray that you will unite us so that we can accomplish your work in ministry so that souls might be saved, that lives might be different, disciples may be made, and leadership developed. Speak to us, dear God. We want to hear from you. And we believe it done now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, I'm start this. I'm like, I'm church. When I got called to Eastern Star Church, I'll start this. 35 years ago, Eastern Star Church had gone through a eight-year storm. Uh, there was a pastor, William. A pastor uh, was there for 20, William Robinson was there for 20 years past and then he died with no transition plan. There was nothing in place that when he died to know how the leadership, who's going to be the next leader of this ministry? So they went through an eight-year storm. In five and a half years, they went through three pastors. So uh, one was there for six months. They let him go. I think another was there for a couple of years. So out of, out of in five and a half years, they went through three pastors. It was, it was really horrific. Uh, sometimes people look at where I am now in ministry and don't know where it was when I got there. So they went two and a half years without a pastor. And uh, it was the kind of church that um, when they had church meetings, it, it was not kind. It wasn't kind of words. Uh, sometimes it got physical. Uh, when they did have those three pastors, they would lock them out of the church. Uh, they had to call the police at times. That's the kind of church God called me to. My, well, one of my friends said that God sends his best people to the worst places. And so, uh, like in the NBA, when they go to the NBA draft, and they talk about lottery picks, the first 13, those first 13 are going to go to the worst, they're supposed to be the best players in the world. They're going to go to the 13 worst teams. So all of you who are in churches with challenges, just know God sends his best people to the worst places. Doesn't mean you miss God. And, uh, and so I went in for a whole year. All I did was preach Jesus. I just talked about God's love, God's salvation. And all I did was preach about being saved. Preach about Jesus. I don't know what they heard over the past eight years. So, um, and the first year, nobody really gave their life to Christ. Nobody really joined our church. It was... Uh, a very interesting first year for me. And matter of fact, when they went, I, 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 our church traditionally is a Baptist church of the Baptist tradition. And when they went to vote for their pastor, they're supposed to bring four names. They had a pool picture. They were supposed to bring four names, and they only brought three. They left my name off. Uh, and then, but the other people didn't get enough votes. So uh, then the congregation made the pulpit committee bring my name. It was the only name they brought, and that's how I got into that church. Um, and it, it, it didn't look well from the beginning. 
But fast forward 35 years, uh, our church at the time had about 300 people in the worship. We had 500 people that claimed to be members of our church. And today we have about 17,000 members. You know, I, I say that not to boast and brag, but to let you know what God is able to do. So we went from all of that to 17,000. And we have one church in three locations. Uh, we got a lot going on, so I'll talk a little bit about that before, hopefully before we get finished. Uh, and, and I just preach about Jesus, and I talk about Jesus for one whole year and, and try to build relationships. <coughs> I didn't make any changes for the first year. For any young pastors in here or pastors just getting started, I made zero changes in the first year because uh, the last three pastors that tried to make changes, the first change that was made was a new pastor coming in. So uh, I, didn't, I didn't bother with any of that. That second year, we had so many people giving it like Christ, United the Church, um, the, the building could seat about 700. We had 900 people sitting in there, people sitting in the hallways. We didn't have screens back then, that was 35 years ago. We didn't have screens, and people just sitting in the hallway. We had people sitting on the, coming up into the pulpit, just sitting on the stairs, <coughs> open the doors to the side, and our deacons would sit out in the alley in chairs and so we would make room in the building for our guests that were coming in. It was it was just really miraculous what God was doing. Yeah. And um, here's the challenge with that. The church was growing so fast physically, but it wasn't growing as fast spiritually. I discovered then it takes about three years to really make a disciple. So I get it like the Christ to get them to grow and develop and be filled with God's Holy Spirit and give and all it takes about three years to make that happen. And so we started, um, as uh, Bishop Blake says, Charles Blake out of California, we started maximizing the use of our facility. So we had different classrooms meeting in the sanctuary and then we have different classes in the fellowship hall in the same room trying not to over talk each other and uh, we went to multiple services at that campus and then finally we started renting uh, on the north side of Indianapolis a hotel. So we had one church in two locations but we were renting those they weren't given properly. We didn't have the financial resources even though we had so many people that were coming. And that's why I wanted to spend some time today uh, talking about the importance of raising the, the resources that you need for the vision that God has given you for your church. And I'm real, I'm real big on uh, on vision. Um, sometimes we try to get people to give to our work, and they don't know what our work is. What is your vision? Uh, vision is a revealed knowledge of God. Where there is no vision, Proverbs 29, where there is no vision, people perish. My people perish for the lack of knowledge. Those verses of the scripture are saying the same thing. But where there is no vision, people perish. My people perish for the lack of knowledge because vision is the revealed knowledge of God. What has what what is the knowledge that God has revealed to you for your church, for your ministry, for your work? Because provisions follow vision. Money follows mission. Sometimes we get, try to get people to help do the work. We try to help get people to give to the, to the call. And they don't know what we're doing. So you have to make it clear. Rebecca said, write the vision. Make it clear so when people are in a hurry, when they're running, they can still get right and right through vision. Um, at our church, at Eastern Star Church, our vision is... Here's the, here's the little motto we use. Where Jesus is exalted and the word is explained. Where Jesus is exalted and the word is explained. And that is actually out of Matthew chapter 28. Go ye therefore to all the nation and baptize and teach. So we are about evangelism. Where Jesus is exalted. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men and women up to me. And we are about discipleship. Where the word is explained. We are making disciples. So we yes, we want to save souls. But we also want to nurture those souls and develop them into the disciple that God wants them to be. And when that happens, there is a social expression of faith. So it's not just what we do inside the church, but we've empowered the people in the church 
to do some outside the church. So we'll talk about that a little bit before I'm about to finish up here. But that vision, everybody in our church know our vision. Even if you've been there for 10 minutes, as soon as you pull up, Jesus Exalted Word Explained. When you uh, go on our website, that's the first thing you see. Jesus Exalted Word Explained. It's written so that people can understand it. I'm very, very heavy on vision and making it clear of that said. Make sure that people understand that. We're trying to get people to work with us, to give to us, to support us. And they don't know what we're doing. Now, uh, my friend Sam Chan, Atlanta, <coughs> Georgia, my, my friend Sam Chan, he's heavy on culture. He says you have to create a culture in your church of love and compassion and unity and togetherness and all. And he's right, culture is important. Because he says if you have a great vision, but your culture in your church is mean and evil and hard to get along with, it doesn't matter what your vision is. Well, I think the other side of that, well, you can have a great culture. Everybody loves each other. But don't nobody know what you're doing. And so you need to have vision. So uh, you really got to find that balance between the two. And when you implement that, then um, you know something special is going to happen. In Seattle, Washington, there was a 16-year-old girl that was sitting on the, on the sofa in her mom's house. And she was at home at night watching television. And then there was a drive-by shooting. So the young men drove by the car and started shooting at the house. Come to find out later, they had the wrong house. They were trying to go out to somebody, and they weren't even in that house. And when the bullets went into the house, it hit the little girl right between her eyes. It didn't kill her with no major injury. She survived it. And, I, and I'm not making it up. Y'all can Google that later and look it up later. It's a real story. And you're trying to figure out how can she get shot between the eyes and survive and not get hurt, not die from that. Of course, when the bullet hit the house, it goes through the siding of the house, it took something off the bullet. It goes through the woodwork of the house, that took something off the bullet. And then when it, when it hit her, she was wearing her glasses and the bullet hit her right on the bridge of her glasses. Here's why she survived because she was trying to correct her vision. Here's why a lot of churches don't survive. We're not willing to correct our vision. What is the vision of your church? What is the mission that God has given to you? Write it out, make it clear, and, um, and help people to understand it because provisions follow uh, vision. Money follows mission. At our church, one of the things we did, I didn't do it the first year, but matter of fact, I didn't even know it the first year. We tried to help the members of our congregation to um, manage money from a biblical perspective. We got a whole piece that they go through. It's actually six weeks for 101 and then uh, another six weeks for 201, so we break it up. But it's about 12 weeks worth of studying out of God's word on how to manage money. I don't care how much somebody loves your church, how much they love you, how much they love God, how much they appreciate the vision and the mission. If they don't know how to manage their money, they're not gonna be able to give. We're talking about, uh, in this nation, so many people are in so much debt and in so much poverty. And a lot of times it's not because they don't make money, it's because they don't know what to do with the money they make. Uh, I was reading recently that one third of the people who live in the United States that makes more than $250,000 a year, one third live from paycheck to paycheck, have no savings. After they pay their bills and expenses, they don't have anything left. And um, nobody taught me how to manage money. I didn't know how to manage money. Nobody taught me how to manage money until I was 27 years old. 27. Uh, and I started pastor when I was 22. I got called to Eastern Star Church when I was 25. Now I'm, I'm managing a church, a ministry that people give resources to, and I didn't even know how to manage my own money. So we teach, I, at, at 27 years old, I went to a conference in Dallas, Texas, E.K. Bailey uh, Preachers Conference. They still have it. Yes, I went there, and Tim Winters out of California was up teaching about money management. And my wife happened to go with me, and we both, because when we, my wife and I got married, 
It wasn't until death do you part, it was till debt do you part. We were in so much debt, I brought school loans, she brought in school loans, she had a car payment, I had a car payment, neither one of us ever were taught how to manage money. And at the time, the number one reason for divorce in America was money. And not always not having it, but not knowing what to do with what you have. We sat in that class, we heard temperatures, and then we started applying. I was 27. At 31, I was living debt-free. Debt, debt-free living is when, uh, debt is when you're making monthly payments on something that depreciates the value. If you're making monthly payments on your credit card because you bought your clothes or your jewelry or you uh, make a monthly payments on your car, anything that you're making monthly payments on that depreciates in value is debt. I'm not talking about expenses. Everybody got a light bill and gas bill. I'm talking about debt, things that depreciate in value. I, I don't include a house as a debt because if you do your homework right, it will appreciate in value. My house is worth twice as much as what I gave for it 20 years ago. So I don't count a house as a debt. That's an investment. And so we teach our members to live debt free. I was 27, in on that debt. Four years later, I was debt free. I have lived debt free for the last 29 years. If I can't pay cash for it, I ain't get it. That includes the car. We teach our members how to live like that. And so, uh, and here's, here's, the, here's the information that we, I just brought this, just so I can show y'all how, uh, you see how many tabs are on here, all the things that we, we go, I guess something that's on money. Just uh, have some idea of, uh, so uh, we just, we walk them through 12 weeks, teaching them how to manage money, how to do investments. The things, I used to teach it myself, then I don't let me teach. We got about 40 people who volunteer to teach. Uh, but I would bring in subject matter experts to deal with how you deal with your school loans, how you deal with uh, investments, and so if I didn't know something, how to buy a house, or how do you manage it, I would bring in subject matter experts to help with that. But fundamentally, here's, here's what my wife and I used to get out of debt, and here's what thousands of members of our congregation have gone through. I had to make it mandatory. I didn't start there, but at some point, you know, we're supposed to be disciples, and there, there's some sacrifice in that. Nobody can be a leader in our ministry without going through those 12 classes I just told you because we do have to handle the resources that God's given to us the way God wants us to do it. So here's fundamentally what we tell them to do. It's prayer. It's spiritual. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness of It all belongs to God. And how you going to manage God's resources if you don't talk to God? I have a financial advisor. They're not just going to go mess with my stuff. No, you come talk to me. See if I really want to do something like that. That's how we have to do it with God. We have to pray. We have to pray. And in that praying, I told our congregation, uh, some of y'all need to confess your sins. So the Bible says, hold oh, man, anything except love. And when you got all that debt that you're not supposed to have, you have committed a sin. You have asked God to forgive you, and God will forgive you. And ask God for the power to be able to get out of the debt and stay out of that debt. So we teach them how to pray, then work. I know it's the great resignation, and everybody's quitting their jobs and all of that, which is interesting to me because we're created in the image of God. And God works six days rest of the seventh day. Why is God working six days and resting one? And we've only worked one day and rest six. Something's not quite right with that to me. Uh, and I know it's a great resignation. I know people push back from that, but if you're going to get out of that, I tell them you have to work. It's a four-letter word, but it's not a bad word. W-O-R-K. And Paul said, work as unto the Lord. And we know he wants us to work. But that's the first thing he did when he created humanity. Put them in the garden, told them to work. Work with your muscle, but you can work that farm out there in the dark. Work with your mind, because you're going to name all these animals. But you got to work with, with muscle or mind. And we know he wants to work, because one of the largest books in the Bible is J-O-B. 42 chapters, J-O-B, 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 J-O-B. I know you say, well, Pastor, you know that's pronounced Job. Yeah, but it still spells job. So we teach them how to work. Work, work, work. And then we teach them how to give. Uh, you can actually, Tim Winter said, and I believe it, and I've proven it, you can give your way out of debt. You can give your way out of debt. Proverbs 3, it says, uh, if you bring the first fruits, 
then your barns will be full and your vats will overflow with new wine. If you want to live in the overflow, you can give. I bring the tithe. I open the windows of heaven. Pray you have a blessing. You'll have room enough to receive it. So we teach them how to give. You can give your way out of that. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, fresh man, shaking together, running over. And uh, but and give to God first. Give that tithe uh, unto the Lord. Uh, then pay your taxes. In full and on time. I don't know about the rest of the country that are represented here, but the United States of America has the best collection agency in the world. It's called the IRS. And you don't want to mess with them. You want to pay your taxes in full and on time. Uh, and then live within your means. Stop trying to keep up with everybody else. Live within your means. Um, you know, they used to have something called layaway in the United States. I also they had it in other places. Where you go into the department store and uh, and you didn't take you didn't take the product with you. You put it on layaway. You put something down on it and you come back later, put a little bit more down on it, and then you come back, put a little bit more down on it, and finally you can pay it off and take it home with you. Then credit cards came into being. And now we get the product and then struggle to pay for it later. And that is messed up. A, a, a whole lot of people trying to keep up with others. I always tell our members, just save your money. Just keep saving it until you, get, until you have enough that you can make cash for. All right? I'm rushing through this. So it's not only personal money management, but our ministry, talking about culture. Well, those who know Sam Chan, tell him I've mentioned it twice. Uh, culture. We created a, a culture of generosity in our church. We don't have an issue talking about money. I know some pastors, some ministers, some Christian leaders never talk about money. They have an issue with one of my friends in Fishers, Indiana. He says that what I that what I do is a hard sale, and these are different times, and uh, you have to have more of a, I guess, a soft sale. I, mean, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. When they come to our church, they know there's an expectation to give. There's an expectation. But we have created a generosity of giving in our church, and it's not something bad. Um, when you're obedient to God, then God blesses that obedience, and God teaches us how to give. So many people, well, I'll do it like this. Uh, Vernon John. Vernon John said that Jesus spoke 20 times more about money than he did about salvation, than he did about prayer, than he did about fasting, than he did about the kingdom. He spoke more about money. Why would Jesus do that? Because so many people have a messed up mindset, a messed up mentality when it comes to money. And it's up to us as Christian leaders, and we go by our church, to get that mindset straight. Balaam tried to curse the people of God and became disobedient to God, and he did it because of money. Delilah sold Samson into the hands of his enemies, and she did it for money. Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts. They lied to the Holy Spirit and ended up dying in a morning worship service, all because of money. Judas, one of the disciples of Jesus, sold him into the hands of his enemies, and he did it for money. And so many people in your congregation and in mine are missing out on what real life is because they don't understand money. They got the wrong mentality about money. So we, 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 I preach it and I teach it, and our congregation doesn't have an issue with it because we've made it a part of, generosity is a part of our culture. We teach them about the purity of giving. And I know that there is a blessing attached to the giving, but we don't give just to be blessed. We give because God said it. That's, that should be the end of that. God said, bring the tithe. That's the end of that. Give. That God said it. So out of obedience, out of faith in Him. Matter of fact, that purity of giving is based on that faith. Because I heard, if I call his name, y'all would know him. supposed to be a financial guru, one of the best in the United States of America. And he is. I just disagree with him on this one thing. He said that, he said the church should never ask poor people for money. I disagree with that because when you read the Bible, y'all, the Hebrew people were in poverty. Most of the time when you read the Bible, they were in oppression. They were in poverty. And God still told them, y'all need to get some money. And my mother got out of debt and poverty because she was generous and she gave. And for some of our churches, if we don't ask poor people for money, we wouldn't raise anything. All I had in my church was poor people. Thank God he changed that 
But so I, we heard it them. There is a blessing that is associated. And when people tell me, if people are going to say, well, Pastor, I would tithe, I just can't afford to. No, this is an issue with your faith. You can't say, I don't, I don't tithe because I can't afford it. Because if you had faith, you would know you can't afford not to tithe. Because you would believe when you tithe, God will open up with that before you have a blessing. You don't have room enough to receive it. So we teach them how to give out of the spirit. Do it because it's right. And then we, our congregation needs to be some poor. You're not going to beat God giving when you give to the poor. When you, uh, Solomon, King Solomon said, when you give to the poor, it's like lending to the Lord. And when, when you loan to God, he ain't like us. Y'all can loan somebody something, and then they got mad at you. They ain't, God ain't like that. Loan somebody something makes my I wish you had never lived it to me. Me too, because you said you was gonna give it back to me. <laughs> God ain't like that. When you give to the Lord, it's like when you give to the poor, it's like living to the Lord. And when God pays you back, he pays you back with you some 30%, some 60%, some 100 percent What we do for the poor. Uh, and I'm gonna get to those pictures so you'll see some of that. And then we demonstrate generosity in our church. If I say my wife and I. My, my wife and I, we've been married for 37 years uh, next month. And we, so yeah, all of our church council, our deacons, uh, our elders, all of them know what we give. The people that count the money, they know what we give. And you know, we try to have some discretion in the way that people talk to. So members know what we give. They see us give. We model that before them. And we model debt free living. And and it's contagious, and they catch on to that. We at one point we had uh, three. So I had four sons in a ten-year period. There were always three of them in college somewhere. They all got their master's degree. Most of them working on the PhD. That for ten years we were paying tuition somewhere, and now they they're all grown. They're all out. So that freed up resources. We, my wife and I have been past 10% a long time ago. We don't just get 10% because with the government, it's, when you give to the government in the United States, it's not just based on amount, it's based on percentage. That's why you hear people talk about being in a different tax bracket. Because the more you make, supposedly, the higher the tax bracket, the more percentage you have. Well, if I'm going to do that with the government, why won't I do that with my God? I'm just going to get stuck at 10%. No. God sent too good to me. And the more I do, then the more God does for me. And that's how that's how we teach it. That's how we live it. We demonstrate it. And then uh, we offer multiple opportunities to give. It's the 21st century. Bro. Some of us, we talk about empowering our church. I went to my friend's church. I won't mention his name. I didn't mention his name. I went to his church uh, a few years ago. And I didn't know how to give in there. I'm sure his members knew how to give. I think give worship, giving is a part of worship. I didn't know how to, because he had such a soft sale. At our church, you know how to give. We got plenty of opportunities. I won't use my church. I'll use uh, Art Jackson's church in, in Miami, Florida. They have six different ways you can give. Every Sunday, he stands up and tells them, you can text to give, you can go to our app to give, you can go to the website to give, you can mail it in, you can put it in the back. They have six, same way with Denny Davis out in, in, um, in South Lake, in, in Texas. Six different ways to give. They created opportunities for people to be able to support the ministry. And we sit up there waiting for somebody to write a check. I don't know a young person with a checkbook. <laughs> so, create different opportunities in, in order for them uh, to be able to give. And then, of course, honesty, integrity, and accountability. Um, I always tell our church where the resources go. Here's how much goes here, here's how much goes there. They, they see the budget every year. I'm not trying to hide anything. We're very transparent. Here's how we accomplish the, the work. Here's where we put it towards. So that, and there, we have systems in place. If somebody gonna steal something from us, you're gonna need quite a few of y'all to do it. But we have systems of accountability that are in place in order to make that happen. And I, I tell uh, young pastors, if you're not, don't think your congregation is, is ignorant. Stop, stop underestimating people's intelligence. Just because somebody doesn't have a degree, 
doesn't mean that they're not smart. And when you start talking about giving to the church and supporting the church financially, um, got his name, the president of George, Georgetown College in Georgetown, Ohio. And you know presidents of colleges, all they do is raise money. And he said that, uh, he said one thing he learned a long time ago, that wealthy people only give to big ideas. Sometimes we're asking people to give to something, and the idea is so small that wealthy people don't even consider it. And when, when you have that big idea, and you're doing some large things, and they consider it, they check this. They're not just giving their money anyway, so we just need to understand that. Uh, and I want to tell you about him so bad. I'm going to rush through this little bit. This is uh, Mason Peoples. Mason Peoples is like six years old uh, in uh, Las Vegas. And he went in for, it was school picture day. They, of course, they take pictures of all the students at the elementary school. They put them in a little binder. They, every student gets a book to take home. And so it was the middle of the pandemic. And uh, Mason went in, and he wouldn't take his mask off. So the photographer said, hey, you need to take your mask off. Let's see that Mason Peoples. He said, no, my mama told me to leave my mask on. Uh, unless I'm eating lunch or outdoors, I have to leave my mask on. He said, the photographer said, well, I'm sure she don't mind if you just take it off for one second and see that big smile. She, she know you're taking this food picture. He said, no. My mom told me, don't take it off. And I always obey my mother. So the photographer was so impressed with a six-year-old who always obeys his mother. He put it on his social media and all over the nation. It went by with people looking at this and people wanted to give money to reward this little boy. So they contacted the mother trying to give him money as a reward for always obeying his mother. And the mother said, no, we don't, we're good. We don't need any money. No, he's supposed to obey me anyway. So no, we want to, she said, finally, she had so many people reaching out to her. She started a GoFundMe account. And she said she thought she raised six or seven dollars and then take him to the store, let him pick out a toy he wanted. And the last time I checked, it took in $38,000. And the reason why he was rewarded with $38,000 is because he always obeys his mother. Some of us, personally, and ministry and church, the reason why we never get financial rewards is because we don't always obey our Heavenly Mother, our Heavenly Father. We don't always obey God, but yet we want the resources to come in behind that. When you give, God gives back to you. That's the first down, shake together, and running over. Uh, come on, empower your church. Connections. Don't try to do it by yourself. Take advantage of collaborations. Take advantage of partnerships. We do so many things in ministry, not just Eastern Star Church. We do so many things in ministry, and at times, we're trying to do it by ourselves. I, I don't try to run that church by myself. We have shared leadership. We have more than one pastor. Um, we, uh, when, when you do staffing, when I do staffing, I staff to my weakness. When I got to that church, we had a part-time secretary, a part-time musician, and a part-time janitor. And now we have 80 staff members, some part-time, some full-time, probably another 20 consultants uh, with their people. And, uh, but when I started staffing, I, I wasn't looking for a youth pastor. I was 22. When I got to start, I was 25. I'm the youth pastor. I wasn't looking for a Christian education director. I studied that myself. I, but what I was looking for, I needed somebody with music because I can't play or sing. I needed somebody with administration. I've learned a lot over the past about 35 years, but I didn't know much about it. So I started staffing to my weakness not to my strengths. But, and then when we start doing things out in the community, it's not just our church, but we included our, our we, we started something called the Rock Initiative, Rock Initiative at our church. Because we have a social expression of our faith. Talking about empowering the church. So we sat down with the community, of one of the, one of the pillars of the Rock Initiative, renewing our community for the kingdom, is to enhance that community. Actually, it's the, it's the neighborhood I grew up in. I, I get to pass them right in the neighborhood that I grew up in. They help me to uh, become successful and, and educated and 
and we kind of learn the leadership and manhood and all of that. Now I get a chance to bless them. But we didn't go to the community and tell them, here's what y'all need. That happened in America and black communities so often. They would come to our neighborhoods and say, white churches and white missionaries, here's what y'all need. Now, you don't live here. You don't even come here. You drive around here on the highway. You don't even come through here. How do you know what we need over here? So we sat down with the community, try to figure out from them what are the challenges, what are the issues, uh, what, what's going on over here, and then we try to address that. But enhancing the community is part of that. And then uh, financial literacy, I told you about that piece. Teaches people how to manage money from a biblical perspective. Uh, we do affordable housing, I'll show you some pictures in a second, and we do education. All of these are partnerships. We partner with the, with the government. We partner with, with the government, with the community, uh, with businesses. And when we when we wrote this plan for the Rocket Initiative, we had people from the community that were on that, that strategy team, that, that task force. We had two deputy mayors that were on there. So we pay taxes like everybody else. We want the contributions that y'all give everybody else. So y'all sit in here with us, help us think through this. We, of course, had uh, members of our church that were on there. We had a police officer that was on there. We had somebody who could write that was on there. Because you got to write the vision. So we did all this planning. And uh, so we're doing food, we're doing housing, we're doing education. With education, we used to have a school. We don't, it's not our school. We have a middle school and a high school that meets on our campus. So uh, we partner with them to educate those children. They're right across the street from us. It's San Cofa School of Success uh, that we partner with them. All the, all the technology in that school, our church provided. That school is, is so underprivileged in terms of the resources that they should be given from the government to public schools. And you've got public schools out in, on the northern side of Indianapolis, and they look like colleges and universities. Then you got schools in black and brown communities that look like a third world country. And the same public funding, anyway, we, we pay for the, everything in technology over there. We do mentoring over there, tutoring over there, but it's partnerships. And um, we went from raising 158, the year before I got there, we raised $158,000. Uh, last year, we raised more than $21 million. Wow. Yeah. How do we go from $158,000 to $21 million? Partnerships, collaborations. One, we taught our people how to give. Two, we kept growing. This time we started growing spiritually as well. And, uh, but eight, eight million of the 21 came in from a grant. One grant. Eight million dollars. We don't have to do it by ourselves. We partner up. And that's significant. I know some of us don't like to partner because well, we got 200 different denominations and now we can't even speak to each other. We all got the same Jesus and we can't work together in community. And for me, if you're doing something for the poor, that's a part of our vision. That's a part of our mission. I hope to win you to Christ while we're doing it. Man, I'm not going to just ignore you and you got resources, you got skills, you got ability, you're doing for the poor, the same thing we're doing. This is in uh, Fort Lauderdale. My wife and I go there every year in December. I take the month of December off. And I, I did that at first because my church couldn't concentrate in the day, looking at Santa Claus rather than the Savior, and I got tired of fighting Santa Claus. He was beating us every year. And I, I'm like, you know what, if y'all ain't listening, I ain't talking. I took it off and let somebody else in the preach and teach. Every year now, our church raises more money in December, and I ain't even there. Uh, we finally learned how to beat Santa Claus. But one of the things we did there, I'm, I'm trying to rush through this, is we, um, we do end of the year giving. So we got all those different ways you can give. I took, but end of the year giving, I tell them, you go back and listen. How much did you give this year? Is it where you're supposed to be? Because sometimes you got things coming in, resources coming in, you don't even think about that. And at the end of the year, you made two hundred thousand dollars, but you only gave uh, fifteen thousand to the Lord. Oh yeah, I will God five thousand dollars. Take it right, check or go online and get five thousand dollars. End of the year again, so they can put it on their taxes for this year. Anyway, this is for a lot of them where my wife and I spend our time. Uh, I get up every morning at sunrise. I check what time sunrise is, but I'm a run. But you got to run early now. It gets hot, so you got to run early. And I go out there, and people would be everywhere. 
on this wall. Y'all, some of y'all been to Miami for like people get <coughs> at 6:15 in the morning. So you got Korean, you got Asians, you got Latinos, you got Blacks, you got White, and nobody's fighting, nobody's cussing each other out. Everybody is getting along. They chit chatting with each other, and I'm trying to figure out. How can we do this in Fort Lauderdale at 6.15 in the morning and we can't do this in our own community? Here's what was going on. Everybody was focusing on the sun. And when the focus was on that sunrise, when they focused on the sun, everybody got away. Everybody was able to do it. The issue for so many of our churches and communities, we don't focus on the sun God. The moment you take the focus off of me and my church and my ministry and put it on the Son of God, that's when you can have those collaborations, that's when people can come together. Uh, real quick, this is some of the things we've done. That's, our, that's the back of our church over there. Um, that's one of the houses that we do. This is like our signature. Right there. That's a brand new house. Um, and we sold that house. This is in Indianapolis. That house has three bedrooms, uh, two car garage, you see the porch, you got a backyard and all that kind of stuff. Everything is spanking brand new. And um, the first person that bought the house, we sold it for $125,000. They moved in with $5,000 worth of equity. Their mortgage, insurance, and the other thing I'm forgetting right now, it was at seven hundred and seventy-five dollars a month. It was a fifty-year-old lady and an eight and her eight-year-old mother. They had rented their entire lives. They had never owned a house before. Rent in Indianapolis, and I know California folk here, y'all. This is I think this is nothing to you. Is twelve hundred and fifty dollars a month to rent? Not own, rent. They get to own a three-bedroom, two-car garage in a nice neighborhood. Uh, for seven hundred and seventy-five dollars. Because we're we're not really we're not trying to make a bunch of money. Anywhere else in Indianapolis, that would cost one hundred and sixty thousand, one hundred seventy thousand. But we're we're just making enough money to build the next house. That's our contribution to the community. We're teaching them how to manage money, teaching them how to buy a house. We are in partnership uh, with somebody that has finance that, that can get the finance and help them with that and teach them how to uh, pay it and all that kind of stuff and take their house. That's a, the that's a house we build partnerships with, um, or we started our own company to build houses too, so we, the first house we built that. Uh, Habitat for Humanity. We donated the land, and of course, have to everybody know them around the world. And they came on over and, and built two of the 13 houses, and we'll build two more now, it'll be 15. I, I, I keep leaving one off. Every time we build a house, in Indianapolis, Indiana, in Arlington Woods, we build a house in Port of Prince Haven. We have a partnership with Step Seminary over there. It's an undergrad school that um, that it educates Christian leaders, but they also do. They believe in a social expression of faith. They do houses. So every time we build one over here, we build one over there. And, um, uh, what am I looking at? Oh, that's the very first house. That's what I was saying about the 80 year old and her daughter. That was the first house that we built. Um, and so that's a beautiful thing. That's our care center. That's where we do, uh, we give away food, we do uh, counseling, uh, clothing. Uh, we help people with their rent, we help them with their mortgage, we help people with crisis. And like the flooding that's taking place, these storms all over our country now. We'll go to certain, we'll send resources to certain communities to make it happen. But again, collaborations. Uh, we got, I forgot the name of They're going to be mad at me. They the name of Midwest Food Bank. Midwest Food Bank comes over with these huge trucks and donate food to us. We give that food away to the community. So we, we do also go buy food, but right now that's our main source of food. So we got the volunteers to help get it done. Midwest has food. And so uh, then we have a urban farm too that we grow our own fruit and vegetables and give them away, as well as in here. This is Sunstone in Arlington Woods. Uh, you see a federal credit union, financial health federal credit union, that leases from us. We get started credit union. We lease to them. They pay us to be in our building. And so all this down here, we, we lease, we rent that out. These are one and two bedroom apartments. 
they have to have a, I guess, name brand no more, like two years old. But we're 10 minutes from downtown, and the rent is, I believe, $650 for one bedroom, and then $750 for a two bedroom. Remember, the average cost is $1,250 a month in this town. So when we rent, we decide who gets to the building, but we own it. So you're not coming in there with no pay down, payday loans and all that kind of stuff, and liquor stores and stuff, selling marijuana and all that kind of stuff. We don't, no. We already got marijuana in that neighborhood. We don't need y'all to bring no more over here. So uh, we determine what goes in. It's services that bless that community. That's our Fisher's campus um, out in Fisher's, Indiana, on the northeast side. Uh, just outside of Indian after we've been there for 20 years. That seats, uh, let's see, that seats about 1,800 people. And finally, after three years, we had 1,800 people in there on Sunday, finally. Uh, that is our north west campus. We've been out there about 10 years. It seats 3,000, again, thank God, for Resurrection Sunday. Uh, so they were in there, and that's uh, our northwest campus. That's our main location. That's the first building that we built. Uh, so the church is up front. The education center is in the back. Let me see if I can understand. We just built a brand new community center um, at 60,000 square feet. And that's where we got the $8 million from, from the Lilly Foundation. And um, and we we provide the, the programming and the staff, but they pay for the silk collaboration. collaboration. Uh, what is this great market stream? Oh, tithes and offering, that's the number one thing that's in the race of resources for our church. But as I go around the country, people are doing all kind of things, renting their space out from their facilities. And they rent it out for meetings, they rent it out for weddings. We don't do all of this, but we, our church, we always got a wedding at one of our members all the time. We, we always meet somewhere. But anyway, people rent these out for receptions, and um, we only do funerals for our members, but people rent their churches out. The funeral home may need the largest space to rent out. Uh, for plays, for concerts, uh, but nobody want to pay. But y'all, we can see how much the convention center costs to use this facility. Uh, everybody can't do that, so they'll rent out churches to have their uh, concerts and banquets. And of course, we do housing, and we lease to businesses. So we have more than one way of, of bringing in the resources in order to do the business. All right.